Welcome to the new season of the Live Your Spa Life Show. The SPA and SPA Life stands for Seek Power Always, that divine power within you to do what you're here to do. The theme for this season is intentional living. Amazing people like you share ways to live by design and with purpose to ensure that this short ride of life occurs with choice, physically, financially, spiritually, and in your relationships to create a world-class life. In these times of uncertainty, it's time for you to move past the distractions and start trusting yourself more through your God-giving knowingness. No one truly knows better what's best for you than you. In this season, you'll have plenty of examples of people choosing their best life and creating a positive impact through intentional living. Thank you for sharing your precious time with us and being part of the Live Your Spa Life conversation. With us today is Eliza Van Court, a professor at Antioch University, a fellow at Cornell, consultant, speaker, and writer. She is an, on the advisory board member of the Performing Arts of Social Change, a member of Govern for America's League of Innovators. Her book, A Woman's Guide to Claiming Space, is now available. She has also given a TEDx talk on women, power, and revolutionizing speech. Her significant presence and engagement on TikTok allow men and women from all backgrounds to claim their space and regain control of the trajectory of their lives. Eliza, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. This is so fun. I just, I'm just curious, like why this space? Like, why is it that you care about women and about claiming space in general? Um, well, it was sort of a long road for me. I had a fairly traumatic childhood actually. And I sort of started thinking that I could be safe if I were small. I conflated invisibility with safety, which is really wrong, obviously. And as I grew up, I started to realize that being invisible isn't safe. It's actually quite dangerous. And then several events happened in my life. And I landed here after a traumatic brain injury that really changed my life and made me inspired to share what I learned with other people. Mm, so great. So, you know, it's interesting as far as, you know, because different people can um, really look at spaces as, as being as one person can say like, oh, this is a fine space, not a problem at all. Right. And how we project things as being unsafe. How do you neutralize uh, unsafe spaces? Well, I mean, I think there are several things you can do. I mean, the first thing is, yeah, that's absolutely right that what is totally safe for one person might feel profoundly unsafe and might be profoundly unsafe for somebody else. In terms of neutralizing those spaces, I mean, sometimes you can't, right? I mean, if you're walking down a dark alley and you see somebody, you may want to turn around and go back because you don't feel safe and there's no way to neutralize it. You just have to leave. But then there are other ways that you can neutralize it when it comes to more nuanced things like being talked over, mansplaining, sexual harassment, bullying, interruptions, and all of those things are really skill-based that I outline in my book that help you to neutralize those everyday things that make your life feel just a little less pleasant. And when you learn how to do that, you actually have a lot more control over your life and it just feels more empowered. Mm -hmm. Got it. So was there something specific that was uh, behind or inspired like your TEDx talk and your book? Something specific? Mm -hmm. um, well, when I was younger, I was actually kidnapped three times by my paranoid schizophrenic mother. And I was taken across the country by truck from truck stop to truck stop from New York to California. And that's when I started to conflate invisibility with safety. Uh, as I got older, you know, I started teaching other people how to be empowered, but I wasn't really doing it myself. And then I had a head injury where my ability to communicate was severely compromised. And I had to rebuild my communication brick by brick. And after I did that, I started giving talks and women would actually follow me to the bathroom after my talks. And they would say, I got to ask you a question I didn't want to ask in Q&A. And I'd say, OK. Um, and then I realized it was the same questions. It didn't matter if I was in Hong Kong or Texas or New York. Same questions. And I thought, you know, we really have to take these questions out of the darkness and into the sunlight. And that was one real motivator for my book. So what was this haunting question that everyone wanted to ask behind the scenes versus in public? 
Oh, it definitely wasn't one haunting question. It was about 50 haunting questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one would have not made a, for a very good book. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, there were all kinds of questions. There were questions about how come people aren't taking me seriously when I talk, which is why I devoted an entire section, which a lot of people don't think of in an empowerment book, but I did a whole section on physicality and voice. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you use your voice? How do you use your body to make sure you're heard? Um, Some people talked about how they had anti-mentors in their life and how do they shut those people down. And other people talked about how they felt like their their boss was being disrespectful to them. I mean, there were just so there were about 50 questions. And when I had recovered from my accident, I'd realized that there were these five buckets, these five qualities that people had that really made them empowered and Then when I started giving my talks, I realized all these questions fell into those five buckets, Mm -hmm. the answers to the, how to do those five things. And so that's the five, those are the five parts of my book. Right. And give us an example of one of those parts and how people's experiences would fall into that. Uh, One of those parts. Oh, well, I mean, let's say you have an anti-mentor, for example. Um, If you have somebody in your life who's an anti-mentor, they are going to actually poison your network they're going to make it much harder for you to have a full and deep relationship with whatever community they're in because they can be very toxic and poison those networks. They can also make you feel undermined. And so people would often ask me, how do you deal with anti-mentors? And how do I? And so I started realizing, okay, what are anti-mentors? How can I get specific? What are their qualities? So I enumerated their qualities, which I'm happy to share with you, and then how to actually neutralize them. So that that's just one example of the kind of questions I would get. Got it. Got it. You know, uh, it, it reminds me when I was a police officer, you know, it's like how you show up in a situation talking about physicality, about confidence and, you know, how you show up was really a huge difference on the impact that you're going to have, you know, especially in the last like few years, people's uh, relationship to fear has been like at an all time high. You know, what is your relationship to fear and how is it that helps you move through it quicker? Um, I don't really believe you can move through fear. (laughs) I don't think that fear is something you can get rid of. I think that's actually a real problem that people have is that we think that in order to do something brave, we need to be fearless. And I don't think that's true. I think most of our bravery actually happens. I mean, what's brave about doing something if it doesn't scare you? To me, that's not brave at all. (laughs) You know, I mean, um, to me, what's really powerful is when you're afraid and you know you're afraid and you know you need to do it anyway. And to me, that's courage and that's bravery. And I think fear to me is really just bravery. I mean, is fear meeting action. That's really all that it is. And and to me, so I, I sort of, yeah, for me, fear is not really something to run from. It's something to say, oh, this is really important for me. I don't want to mess it up or else I would be afraid to do it wrong. Right. Absolutely. Well, and that is a great strategy to move through it, right? Because a lot of times people will have fear and it'll paralyze them, you know, and I love it because that's literally the definition of being courage is like being faced with these things and doing it anyway. So yeah. what are what are some of the techniques that you utilize when you're facing something that fears feels fearful, um, but that you're moving into the action? I mean, usually if it's a physical thing, like let's say I have to give a talk in front of thousands of people, which I do sometimes have to do, and I get a little nervous, um, I observe it. So I say, oh, my heart is racing. Oh, I'm sweating. Oh, that's interesting. My hands are shaking. (laughs) And then I tell myself, none of this will kill me. It's actually not possible. Any of this will kill me. No one knows about it unless I tell them. So I'm just going to go do it anyway. And it doesn't matter. It's just going to exist with me. I think that a lot of times that's a great example of you always hear these things like visualize an ocean <laughs> and maybe go away. Like, you know, like imagine the audience is naked. Like nobody, that never works. We all know it doesn't work. In fact, you're sitting there trying to visualize an ocean getting more nervous because you can't see the ocean, you know? Yeah. And so for me, it's just like, yeah, this is what happens. And I'm experiencing it. And that's okay. That's a part of the human condition. It doesn't need to stop me. And that's the critical thing. I mean, and I think women are often given the message when it's hard, then don't do it. It's okay. Just, just stop. And men, I mean, they've actually done research, uh, particularly in STEM that when men call home and say, Hey, I'm having a hard time. The parents say, come on, you can push through this work harder. And the parents say to women, well, maybe it's not the right profession. 
Mm. And we really need to learn that attitude and kind of ignore those messages of like, I can't. Um, Okay, so I have to work harder. That's okay. Hard work is fine. It's part of life. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's such an important message to, you know, realize and and look at any of our past experiences of things that we have gotten through hard things, which shows evidence that we can do it, right? And that we can do hard things. Uh, There's so many different evidence that say things like, you know, even women executives where they could have this great idea, but they'll keep it to themselves, whereas men will take that risk and they'll just put it out there. So to get beyond that hesitation that can happen can really make a difference. And in our you know, past experiences can really make a difference in how we look at things. Um, for you having a schizophrenic mother, how did that, uh, that life uh, really impact your work today? Um, well, I think anytime you have trauma, uh, you have kind of two different ways you can go. One is the trauma, you can fall on the floor. It's like any kind of failure in your life, right? You fall on the floor and you say, I think I'm going to stay here. I can't get up you fall on the floor and you get back up again, but you live a life of fear. You know, you're always kind of worrying to try something new because something bad could be around the corner. And the last one is you get up and you say, wow, I really fell down. I need to learn and grow so I can move forward. I'm going to take this experience and see what it can do for me to change my life for the better. And I think, I mean, therapy, I believe for everyone should be issued a therapist at birth. Therapy was incredibly helpful. I had an incredible community of women and just a lot of people in my life who swooped in and said, like, we're not going to lose this person. And I, you know, a lot of people ask me that question of, you know, how, how did you get through this or how did that inform your life? And really what I always say is, you know, my life really isn't about what one person can do. Um, my life is about what you can do to change the life of one person, because I've had a lot of people in my life who've really helped me and made a huge difference in my life. Absolutely. You know, there's people who have like their biological family and then the created family and the circle of people that they've created to have that safe network, to bounce things yeah. off of, to, yeah. to be there in, in challenging times. That's so, right. You know, and a lot of times too, these experiences, you know, if we look at them in terms of, okay, how did this happen for me? What did I learn from this? And then turn around and utilize it in your work and your personal life. You know, you've, you've raised, you know, boys and girls. Um, how are you, how did you, with all your experience, uh, look at doing that differently? Well, I mean, I wanted to raise feminist children. And I think um, there's been a real movement to turn feminism into a dirty word, which I find to be so problematic because, Feminism is literally like the belief that women should have equal rights and opportunities. So if you don't believe that and you're not a feminist, I have a problem with you. I think everyone should be a feminist. Um, and I wanted to raise feminist boys and I raised and feminist girls and they are and, and feminist girl. I have one girl. Um, I tried. I tried. I didn't do it all the time, but I tried to treat them really equitably. I found sometimes myself slipping into having my daughter doing more chores. I didn't even notice I was doing it. And I'd, so I'd be like, whoa, I study this stuff. and. I'm telling her to do the dishes. Um, There's all kinds of research that I relied on. Like we've actually found that when parents are parenting their kids, they tell little boys stop interrupting at a lower rate than little girls. So little girls learn to shut up and little boys learn that they can interrupt. And so it's not that boys are, you know, are going out there being men or saying, I'm going to go interrupt all the time. Like not at all. Literally our training our communication training is teaching these patterns. And so of course, how, how of course we're going to have problems with society when it's so ingrained. So I tried to do things to try to be as equitable and fair as I humanly could. Right, right. What do you think has led to, you know, the word feminism and feminist as being that dirty word? Well, throughout history, when you want to get a group that is oppressed and get them to actually stop working to stop the oppression, you demonize their efforts to stop the oppression. I mean, when you looked at the civil rights movement, people, MLK, Dr. King was considered public enemy number one by the government. In hindsight, we see all this stuff, but back in the day, he was considered this bad guy and everybody was trying to say what a horrible guy he was. You know, now we have a very different view of history, but when you delve into the news footage, and you delve into the papers, it's very, very different. Um, I think that feminism is another example of that. If you can tell someone that you're a crazy radical 
because you identify as a feminist, then basically any time any woman stands up for another woman and you call her a feminist, her instinct is to back down. So she avoids that demonized label. So to me, the solution to that is to embrace that label and say, yes, I am. I'm absolutely a feminist. Why aren't you? Mm-hmm. You should examine that. You know, we should right. all be feminists. And so for me, I mean, I've, in my book, I have a chapter called Crazy Feminist Bitch, um, which is about the three basic categories that women get put into that are demonized. So crazy is if a woman shows legitimate anger. Mm-hmm. Um, bitch is if she says opinions that somebody disagrees with. <laughs> right. And feminist is somebody who advocates for other women. And these are all considered negative. And I, I say in my book, you know, I actually have crazy feminist bitch action heroes in my book because I love superheroes. <laughs> um, but I, I believe we should all be crazy feminist bitches right. as much as humanly possible. <laughs> right. Well, and I think this is why it's important to have these kind of conversations, because I think sometimes people will get stuck on a particular word and think that they understand what the scope of that is or what that actually means. But when you get underneath it, you kind of look at it. I think that there's been a lot of, uh, you know, political statements that, you know, people who are feminists are men bashers. Right. But if you look at the definition of itself and looking at, OK, well, how is it that we can work together? How is it that we can, you know, have equal experiences, um, but also embrace the differences between men and women too. It can sometimes feel like a a slippery slope if people don't actually have the deeper conversation about it. I think that's the same way with everything. We're in a bite-sized world. I mean, I'm on TikTok. My kids convinced me to go on TikTok. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I have a pretty large following. I have a quarter of a million followers on TikTok. And, you know, that's a minute to three minutes that you have to unpack really complex issues. I, and, you know, as an author, I can tell you that people don't really read books anymore. My book's a bestseller. You'd think that was millions of copies. To be a bestseller, you need to sell 4,500, 6,000 copies because people do not read books. And so I, I think that these conversations are really what we don't have enough of and will show if we really had more of them. I mean, I, I consider myself quite left, quite progressive. I have very dear friends who are on the right and we have beautiful conversations and we learn from each other. And I always walk away feeling like I changed their mind a little and that they taught me something and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And there's no way we're ever going to survive in this society if we have people who literally will not just take a moment to at least hear what someone has to say. Right, right. Well, and that is just kind of the, you know, the bottom line of communication is to see, okay, yes, we hear these titles, we hear these words, we have these labels. I mean, even just politics in general, I mean, what does Democrat and Republican actually even mean, right? Does that, like, these are labels just like with religion, like these are all these topics, politics, religion, all these things that people have Mm -hmm. one word to them and they have, you know, uh, feelings and thoughts about them because of maybe how they were taught or their own personal experiences. But there's always something below that of why they feel a certain way. And sometimes until somebody actually has a conversation, they actually may not even know why they uh, believe what they believe or the the reasons that they look at the things that they look at. So, you know, I think it's it's so important to you know, really look at having that that deeper level to, and just ask questions and be curious, right? Just be curious about why is it that you think this way or, or what this looks like. And, you know, I know that your uh, accident, um, you know, you hit by a car and on your bicycle and that really impacted you um, and affected your communication as well. So how, how did that accident come into play with uh, your communication and just rebuilding that tool? Mm -hmm. I want to, if you don't mind me circling back to what you said about words for a second, because I think that's really important. Um, I think the the flip side of that is that often we don't know what words mean, or we allow, that's another example. You know, for example, you know, Democrats, for example, um, tend to have a more equitable tax structure. That just is a fact. Republicans tend to favor big corporations. But yet, you know, Democrats are not always being identified as like the party of the working class, even though most of their legislation is from working class. That's a problem with the Democrats of their crappy messaging of what they're actually doing. I mean, it's just terrible. But um, but I think that, you know, I've always said I wish we would just have two different pieces of paper sent out and everybody has to put down what their policies are, you know, just the 20 top things. And we can just look and compare them because there's so much subterfuge about the way in which we communicate this stuff. 
And I mean, I, I know people who don't even didn't know that the Supreme Court impacted a lot of the decisions that would affect them directly and that how each party would vote. So I think it's really, really important that, you know, we stop getting our news from social media, start <laughs> reading more books, start, you know, uh, f- teaching media discernment in our high schools. But I I digress. Um, but that's <laughs> another thing. I, that's one of my issues is like we need to teach people how to discern media so we're not all, you know, doing our own research from the most ridiculous sites that could be we could ever do them from. Right, right. Well, and as we know, too, you know, I mean, so much of politics with special interest groups and all those things stack up all these unrelated things, right? So people think that they are voting for one thing, but they don't realize that there's a lot of other things that are wrapped into it. So, you know, it can be a a convoluted thing. And that's why, you know, having these deeper conversations and doing research and, and really getting clear on some of those things is so important. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that if we were clear on these things, people would be um, participating more in the political process and voting more. Right, right. So how did this accident actually impact your communication? And um, you, you kind of, did you have to relearn communication? Did it have you have an insight of looking at life differently? How, how was that impacted? Oh, I absolutely did have to relearn. My friend came over, I think it was about five months after my accident, somewhere in there. And I said, you know, I feel like my memory is back, but everybody's acting strangely. And she said, Eliza, they're not acting strangely. You're acting strangely. Your vocabulary is shot. And frankly, you're talking and you're not really talking very well. And then I called my friend who's a nurse because she always tells it like it is. And I was like, am I sounding weird? And she said, dude, you sound like a stone third grader. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's <laughs> not good. I've never seen a stone third grader, but it's not good. So um, that was really scary because my mom had been trapped in her own mind and not known she was crazy. And I didn't know. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I'm this is happening to me. And I had to rebuild my communication. I stayed in bed for a long time. I don't want to say that I was like, I'm going to rebuild my communication. Not at all. I basically hid in bed for like three weeks. And then I thought, you know, I've been through so much. This is not going to be the thing that takes me down. This woman on her cell phone is not going to be the thing that takes me down who hit me with her car. So I um, I started watching people and observing. And I also had taught a acting technique. My background's in political science and the performing arts. So I taught an acting technique for 20 years that teaches people how to really focus on another person and see their micro behaviors. I just went over everything I'd ever learned and I rebuilt my communication. I remember when one of my students came over and she started to cry and I thought I was better. And I said, oh my God, am I not better? And she said, no, no, no. I'm crying because you're you again. In fact, I feel like you're stronger. And I was so relieved. And I thought when she left, I'm a real sci-fi nerd. I love sci-fi. And I (laughs) kept picturing Neo in the Matrix in that moment when the bullets are coming. And he's like, no. And they all go down. I was like, and he sees the HTML on the side. I was like, I see the HTML of communication. This is unbelievable, which is a big reason why I wanted to write my book and share with people what I learned. Absolutely. Well, I'm a big fan of the matrix as well. And you actually have an analogy between the matrix and communication. So do share. (laughs) Oh, well, I mean, there are lots of different things. I think that the, there are ways in which we, if we start to really understand communication on a incredibly deep level, it's very much like the difference between the Ebuchadnezzar and the matrix, (laughs) you know, and the Ebuchadnezzar is dirty and the food sucks and the clothes are terrible, but it's real. And I think once you start to understand communication really depthfully, you understand issues of sexism and race and classism and ageism and all the isms because you see the way different people, even pretty privilege, you know, how pretty people are just, just these minute ways that people treat people who are pretty differently than people who aren't. And so you start to really see all of these things. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. You can't get plugged back into the matrix. It just doesn't, doesn't work. And, and so then you have to live in the real. And mm-hmm. I think that's, you know, once you live in the real, in my opinion, if you see injustice, you have a moral obligation to try to make things better, which is what I try to do with my life as much as I can. I don't always succeed, but I try. <laughs> I love that. Well, you know, we we create our environments, you know, in so many different ways. And, you know, one of the things I always love to ask my guests is that, you know, because we create our environments, you know, we live life differently in our bedroom versus our office or our kitchen. So what is your favorite room in your home and why? 
No, <laughs> no one's ever asked me that question. <laughs> um, I mean, am I allowed to say you have sex in your bedroom? So that's a pretty great room. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My boyfriend would probably like that room. Um, so, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I think that the kitchen in the bedroom would have to be uh, tied for unbelievably different reasons. <laughs> the, the, the kitchen would be where my family, you know, eats and plays Catan. I'm Italian, half Italian. And, you know, I love to feed people and I love to be in, I'm not a very good cook, but I do love things like nachos and, you know, that kind of thing. So I love to be <laughs> in my, in my space and, you know, take care of people. I love that. And, you know, the bedroom, there's always fun things that happen there. So I guess I got to say it's an equal. It's, it's two parts of one, one part of the I other. I love that. And I, nachos is definitely a food group. So it's a must. And I think <laughs> that is huge. Absolutely. Yes. So good. And uh, I just, I love that question because people take it in so many different directions. It's just nuts. It's like, you know, we really do create our own experience. And you, you find out what's important to people with, uh, you know, where they spend their time and who they spend that time with and, and what that actually looks like. So it's it's kind of a... a huge fun thing yeah oh my gosh I'm sorry that is i've never thought about that that's a fascinating question i think it probably tells a lot about a person my answer probably does <laughs> my kids and recreation <laughs> right absolutely it's it's so good you know and, and you know one of the reasons too i like asking it is that you know whether you have a lavish space or you have like a small comfy space it's like we all get to create something about that like something that is important to us um what that looks like and i mean sometimes People will say, well, like, I like a, a certain candle in my room, right? Or I just love just being in a room with my family and what that looks like. And so I think that, you know, part of the conversations and things that we have with people is, you know, we have the commonality of, you know, spending time with the people we love, really focusing on the things that are important to us and really getting to uh, to share that in so many different ways. So I think uh, that's a good thing. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So, well, I just want to thank you for, for your wisdom, your insight, sharing your life experience and all of those things. And I think that, uh, you know, there's people in our audience would love to stay in contact with you. How can they best do that? Um, well, you can go to my website, which I actually, I hope to get a lot more interactive next year, which is elizavancourt.com. There's no you in court. Um, and then you can find me on all the social media platforms. Although I will say that my Twitter presence is quite abysmal. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but I, the, I'd say the best way to get a hold of me, if you want to actually get a hold of me is through Instagram or Facebook, because I can't really answer everyone on TikTok, which is pretty big, but, um, yeah, I always love hearing from people. Um, and I get a lot of talks through these kind of things where I get to actually meet amazing people throughout the country. So it's, it's always lovely. So please feel free to reach out. Perfect. Sounds good. And as you know, our theme for this season is intentional living. So in what way are you living an intentional life? Well, I mean, I do believe that um, it's important to claim space is what my book is about. And for me, to claim space is to live the life of your choosing unapologetically and bravely. And you know what I think about bravery. Um, and so I try to do that, which is really about being in my own power and making sure I'm lifting up the people around me. Cause I don't think you can just claim space for yourself. Yeah. You, you know, the real people who really claim space are worried about themselves and the world as a, you know, in general. So that's kind of what I try to do again. I don't succeed a lot of the time, but I definitely do my best. Good. I love that. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time with us here today. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. And for our listeners out there, you know, this just ties us back into, you know, spa life, you know, the acronym for that is seek power always, right? That power within you that you have, you do get to claim that space. You get to be brave and courageous. And, you know, I love this, the part of the conversation where we talked about, like, we can do hard things, like you can face them, even if you're fearful of them and going, but if you still do it, that is really standing up for yourself. And that's really claiming that aspect of it for you. So if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to reach out to either Eliza or I, we'd love to just help you in uh, any way that we can. And until we connect again, live your spa life. Bye for now. Bye-bye.